So again, this evening, we will be hearing from Father Richard Fragomeni, who is a priest of the Diocese of Albany, New York. He currently serves as the rector of the Shrine of Our Lady of Pompeii in Chicago and serves as also a professor of liturgy and preaching at CTU since 1990. Um, I'll just have to say that I did my master's degree at CTU in the early 90s. And while I didn't have him as a professor, he was definitely a presence and just brought a great joy and support to our liturgies and would be singing in the stairwell. You could hear it echoing up and down and that was always a great joy. So I'm happy to be here many years later and um, bringing his gifts and wisdom to all of you. So take it away, Father Fragomeni. Okay. Go ahead, uh, we'll share your... Welcome everybody. Can you all hear me okay? I, I trust that that's, this is gonna work. Mm -hmm. uh, I want you to know this is just a strange phenomenon uh, talking to myself on the screen and, uh, and sitting in my couch where I watch television. So it's, it's, I, I'm, I'm glad that we can have this kind of fireside chat, if you would, uh, and uh, have a conversation about purgatory, the second in the series as Marion uh, uh, spoke. Uh, if you remember, if you were here last week, we spoke about a book by Stephen Cave entitled, um, uh, it was entitled uh, Immortality, The Narratives of Immortality. And we spoke about those four narratives, the elixir of life narrative, the immortality of the soul narrative, the resurrection narrative, the uh, legacy narrative, and then the, the narrative of, of, um, of uh, wisdom, the wisdom way. And, and this tonight, we're going to take a look at another PowerPoint that uh, I have put together. And the title, as you will see, is Whatever Happened to Purgatory? And uh, I chose that because for many of us, uh, as I look out here into, the, into our cyberspace, many of us can remember when purgatory was an extraordinary essential part of our understanding of life and death and spirituality. Some of you I'm sure remember uh, that we were asked actually to um, pray for the souls in purgatory for the whole month of November. If you recall, there was even a Franciscan devotion developed by St. Francis in the, um, in the 13th century, the, the Portiuncula. If you remember the Portiuncula devotion, some of you who are Franciscans here uh, on August 2nd. Uh, and, and, and during that time, as a child, I can remember I won the prize one year for getting the most souls out of purgatory because you had to go into a Franciscan church at the time. So there was a, a, a conventional Franciscan church right around the block where I lived. You'd go in, say six Our Fathers, six Hail Marys, six Glory Bees for the intention of the Pope. And um, then you would uh, apply that either to a specific person in purgatory or to a general name. And I think you go in and out of the church from six in the morning till midnight of, of August the 2nd. And I went back and forth, back and forth, in and out doing these prayers. And I think my score was 750 souls out of purgatory that day. This was based upon this amazing Catholic imagination uh, that grew up uh, by the 13th century in a, uh, and we'll take a look at a book here in a moment, the, when purgatory was made a doctrine of the church. And um, it, 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 it was based upon the idea that there was a three kind of tiered uh, church, communion of saints was in three tiers. You had the church militant, who was the church on earth, the church suffering, who were the souls in purgatory, and the church triumphant, who were the saints in heaven. And if you recall, this wonderful interplay and interrelationship between the living and the dead 
was extraordinarily profound through the centuries, extraordinarily profound where the church militant, us, we would pray for the church suffering the souls in purgatory when the souls in purgatory were released from purgatory to go to be the church triumphant, they in turn prayed for the church militant, which is us. So that day, there were 750 uh, souls that through the intercession uh, that I made through the prayers of St. Francis and the mercy of God, they were uh, um, freed from uh, their, the sufferings of purgatorial fires and they were brought into the church triumphant to pray for us and pray for uh, me. And um, I still feel uh, a kind of a, a, a longing for that kind of religious imagination. However, that imagination pretty much shifted after the Second Vatican Council. And we'll take a look at that next week when we take a look at funeral rites, because the funeral rites after the council were done in such a way that what you find is that uh, we had, we called it the mass of the resurrection or, or we called it the, um, the, uh, the, the mass of the, on the a Christian burial. And as I mentioned last week, there is a kind of a, a, um, a kind of a, a feel that somehow, uh, Purgatory, which is a doctrine of the church, somehow took a back seat and people were moving directly from um, uh, earth right into heaven. Now, this history of purgatory uh, is shown in an amazing book that I want to recommend to you if you're interested about the, this, this, uh, the development, the history of purgatory even before the doctrine was, was uh, confirmed in the 13th century. Um, the, it's by Jacques Le Goff, who was a historian, a French historian, and he writes about the birth of purgatory, uh, and he does three things. He gives the prehistory of purgatory with the development of what we saw as the blending of the narrative of the resurrection and the narrative of the immortality of the soul as it came together in Catholicism, he gives a brief history of that. And then he talks about the paralleling of the, the, um, the doctrine of purgatory in the 13th century with the rise of what he calls the middle class, the third estate. Because up until the doctrine of purgatory, uh, Catholics, Christians, when they died, either went to heaven or to hell using Matthew 25, the story of the sheep and the goats, um, you, what you did to the least of my brothers and sisters. So there was, a, there was only two places in the afterlife that a person could go. You either went to heaven or you went to hell. By the, by the 13th century, however, there was a realization that there needed to be a middle place, uh, a, a purgatorial place, where you uh, moved from, um, you moved from that 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 two-tiered afterlife, and the, the Catholic Church, by virtue of its doctrine, uh, developed the the third tier, the middle tier of purgatory, the Church suffering. Now, uh, the the interesting thing that that Le Goff does in this book is he does a historical placement of the development of this doctrine in the 13th century with the rise of the middle class. And that's the third point he does and the rise of modern capitalism. Uh, because what happens here is that before the birth of purgatory in the 13th century, um, usurers, this is a, a, an example he gives, usurers, those were people, bankers really, bankers, who made money on other people's money. Usury was considered to be a serious infraction against the law of God, to make money on other people's money, paying interest, for instance. So the usurers, 
all were placed in hell by the church. So that that was a considered a serious sin. And if gone unrepentant, you the usurers making money on other people's money went to hell. But when the birth of purgatory comes, not only do you see the rise of a middle class, so you're no longer living in hell on earth if you were a, a, a serf, or you're no longer living in heaven on earth if you were a lord. Now there was the rise of the middle class in Europe during these centuries, but you also had, when purgatory was born as a doctrine, you also had the usurers who were usually put to hell, the usurers were now put in purgatory. That means there was a tacit validation of making money through banking and interest on other people's money, the rise of what he calls modern capitalism is, is given birth with purgatory because now all the usurers, uh, instead of going to hell, eternal damnation, they weren't so bad, they went to the middle tier, the uh, purgatory. So this is a fascinating historical analysis of Catholic doctrine and social uh, development. Uh, I would recommend this very, very highly to any of you who are interested. Uh, uh, it's an amazing book um, uh, and I would recommend it extraordinarily much to any of you. Um, it was this birth of purgatory then through the centuries that developed into what most of us were used to at least if you're over 50, what you were used to with what I mentioned earlier, with prayers for the poor souls, suffrages for the poor souls, and, um, and the hope that the church suffering, becoming the church triumphant, would help us get there as well. Uh, Dante, of course, uh, even before uh, this, the, the doctrine is for formalized, is developing his Divina Commedia, where he's talking about the levels of the seven levels of purgatory, the seven levels of hell, and the seven levels of, uh, of heaven, that, that, uh, that wonderful number. So after the Second Vatican Council, um, there seems to be a kind of a lessening of this understanding and uh, relying on the mercy of God we find more and more and in our funeral liturgies that uh, people are assumed uh, are in the kingdom of heaven. And so you do see this in the liturgies of the funeral rites, which I said next week, we'll take a look at more specifically. But what I'd like to do uh, now is to say that Benedict XVI was uh, attempting to retrieve the doctrine of purgatory, um, he was attempting to retrieve it in an encyclical he wrote, Spe Salvi. So this is where the title of our talk comes from, uh, Purgatory in a New Key, because what Benedict is trying to uh, do is retrieve it using contemporary theologies of death and contemporary understandings of hope. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a look at uh, several of the paragraphs that deal specifically with this new understanding of purgatory. Um, because up until then you had Dante, you had some of the saints who had visions of purgatory uh, Catherine of Genoa, Catherine of Siena, were having given, uh, Teresa of Avila as well, given visions of the afterlife and the sufferings of the church suffering in purgatory with fires, purgatorial fires. I remember um, as a child also, and some of you may remember this, um, uh, being invested in the brown scapular of Our Lady of Mount Carmel on my first communion day. Some of you uh, may remember that. Um, and uh, we were uh, told, we were catechized 
that the Sabbatine privilege was given by Our Lady of Mount Carmel, that whoever wore the scapular faithfully, that on the first, on the Saturday after they died, that she would take them out of purgatory, thus uh, limiting the uh, stay in purgatory. This uh, is, is that, that, that Sabbatine privilege is still in the books, but I have yet to find uh, first communicants being in, invested in the scapular of Our Lady of Mount Carmel as we were, as some of you might remember in first or second grade. There was also the promises both to Margaret Mary, Alacoc, and to uh, the children at Fatima of the five first Saturdays and the nine first Fridays. These are still devotional practices, but associated with these practices was the limit on the stay in purgatory. That if you did the nine first Fridays, the promise was that you would not die without having confessed your sins to a priest. So therefore you would be guaranteed a divine passage into heaven. Or the five first Saturdays, the same kind of promise that if you did the five first Saturdays consecutively in a row, that there was the, uh, the promise by Our Lady uh, that you would not suffer the pangs of purgatory, but would be brought into the kingdom of heaven, the church triumphant. So these, these, these devotional practices are still, uh, uh, are still present in the church and in some sectors of the church, but they are not as prominently there as they used to be before the council. So what Benedict XVI does in this encyclical is he talks about the four last things, um, death, judgment, heaven and hell. And then he, um, he, 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 he re understands purgatory in a way that I think is important because I, I, I show this to the preaching students at CTU. I show this to the presiding students at CTU that, that there is a way to actually preach about purgatory. And there's a way to hold this doctrine as a, as a doctrine of the mercy of God um, in, in a way that that, um, that that translates it out of the 13th century and the medieval Renaissance modalities of imagination into a new imagining of what this doctrine means for us as Roman Catholics. So that's uh, what I'd like to do is I'm gonna go over these several passages now in this uh, and then we'll open it up for some conversations. Um, so um, paragraph 45 is where I'd like to look. Again, the doctrine, the document is space salvi. You can Google that in and find this. I'm gonna start with paragraph 45. He, he, uh, he says this, he says, there is also the idea that this state the afterlife he's talking about can involve purification and healing, which mature the soul for communion with God. So again, he's, he's talking about the afterlife and specifically the purgatorial doctrine. So there is a way of, he's noticed the, of the way of purifying to mature the soul for communion with God. The assumption is, is that there, there needs to be an openness to communion with God that oftentimes um, is not realized uh, in life. And so in the afterlife, it is matured. We do not need, he says, here to examine here the complex historical paths of this development, the development of the doctrine of purgatory which Le Goff does in his book. 
it is enough to ask what it actually means. And what he, 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 so he says, with death, our life choice becomes definitive. Our life stands before the judge. So he's basically talking about what we would call the personal judgment uh, uh, that we as Catholics believe that at death, the immortal soul stands before the judge. And he doesn't want to go into the complex historical path of purgatory, which again, I recommend Le Goff's book for. Then he says in paragraph 45, there can be people who have totally destroyed their desire for truth and readiness to love. People for whom everything has become a lie. People who have lived for hatred and have suppressed all love within themselves. So he's basically saying, hey, look, as we're living, you can sell your soul out to the lie. Um, uh, there, are, there was a school of, uh, of, of moral theology called the school of the fundamental option, that there are some who are so distorted and who have totally destroyed the desire for truth and the readiness for love, that they have made a fundamental option to live as people of the lie, who have lived for hatred and have suppressed all love in themselves. This is certainly uh, what uh, hell uh, uh, is, it, he's talking here about the eternal damnation of those who be even before death have destroyed in themselves uh, this desire for God. He says, this is a terrifying thought. And then, um, and this, it is a terrifying thought because there is the potential for us as humans to make a fundamental option to destroy any empath empathic communion with others and live only for ourselves in the egoic destruction of the soul. Then he goes on to say, on the other hand, there can be people who are utterly pure, completely permeated by God, and thus fully open to their neighbors, people for whom communion with God even now gives direction to their entire being and whose journey towards God only brings to fulfillment what they already are. Listen to that wonderful language of this, of this piece, because basically what he's saying is he's talking about the saints, which we might call the holy ones, the saints who perhaps we have known in our lives, in our families, in our religious communities, uh, in our interactions, in our parishes, people who are completely permeated by God. And these people are already living heaven on earth, like the former uh, uh, paragraph in the terrifying thought, who are living hell on earth, completely isolated from, uh, from God. These are people completely permeated. Now, you get those two extremes, heaven and hell. But then what he does very cleverly is he shows the middle way, which is the, the way purgatory was developed and came to be, uh, a la Lagoff's book. So he basically continues with paragraph 46 and says, yet, he says, we know from experience, um, we know from experience that neither case is normal in human life, totally devoid of God, and totally open to God. For the great majority of people, we may suppose there remains in the depths of their being an ultimate interior openness to truth and to love to God. In the concrete choices of life, however, it is covered over by ever new compromises with evil. Much filth covers purity, but the thirst for purity remains. Now, this is much different uh, than Martin Luther's approach to this. Um, for Catholics, the purity is there, and then we get covered over 
with filth. This certainly, uh, uh, we could develop this coming out of a theology of baptism, uh, which we mentioned last week, where we die with Christ, Romans 6, where, uh, but the impact or the effects of sin continue to, um, to impact us. The, the, the effects of sin are still there, but the thirst for purity and communion with God remains. Um, uh, this is, this, he, so he's, he's now laying the groundwork for those of us who live in that middle place where neither people living in hell nor people living in, in the communion with God totally, but in between. And then he says, Paul begins by saying that Christian life is built upon a common foundation, Jesus Christ. And the foundation endures. If we have stood firm on this foundation and built our life upon it, we know that it cannot be taken away from us even in death. So we're not living saints, nor are we living uh, 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 alien from God, but what we are invited to engage in is to recognize that the, that the foundation of Christ, even though broken by our sinfulness and by the, um, by the tendency we have towards um, evil, nevertheless, this cannot be taken away. This foundation of baptism in Christ cannot be destroyed even in death. And then the, the encyclical continues with 1 Corinthians 3, 12 to 15. In this text, it is in any case evident that our salvation can take different forms, that some of what is built may be burned down, that in order to be saved, we personally have to pass through fire so as to become fully open to receiving God and to be able to take our place at the kingdom of the eternal marriage feast. So he's now talking here uh, and he's using Paul as the purgatorial fires uh, because that was the language that you even see in Dante and in some of the visionaries that it's not only the, the, the eternal fire of hell which is for those who are totally bereft of any desire for truth or love. But it's, this is the middle passage where there is nevertheless purgatorial fire. And then Benedict puts that into a new key. If you look now in paragraph 47, uh, Benedict says, he said, he says, so what is this fire? He says, the encounter with Christ is the decisive act of judgment at the moment of death. So he's basically saying that, um, that uh, he, you, you eventually you'll see, he's basically saying that, that at the moment of death and judgment, we meet Christ. And this is the decisive act, this encounter. And then read this beautiful passage. Before Christ's gaze, all falsehood melts away. The encounter with Christ, as it burns us, transforms and frees us, allowing us to become truly ourselves. All that we build during our lives can prove to be mere straw, pure bluster, and it collapses. Now, uh, just a, a sidebar. These are what I'm showing you are portions of these paragraphs. And I'm trying to, uh, for the sake of time, fill in the blank. I would recommend that you look at Space Salvi and you can read the entirety of these paragraphs uh, and, uh, and, 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 and see whether or not I'm filling in the blanks um, legitimately. Because he continues then and says, but this uh, encounter with Christ, this, this encounter as it burns us. So he's using the fire metaphor, but it is a blessed pain in which the holy power of his love sears through us like a flame 
enabling us to become totally ourselves and thus totally of God. So he's talking here about those who, uh, who are in that middle ground, that the encounter with Christ is a, a, a moment of judgment and it is a moment of judgment that purifies us. So here is the heart of his rethinking of the, of the, of the experience of purgatory. Then he goes on to say, in this way, the interrelation between justice and grace also becomes clear. The way we live our lives is not immaterial, but our defilement does not stain us forever if we have at least continued to reach out towards Christ, towards truth, and towards love. This is again um, a, 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 a way of he's talking about sin, and certainly he is talking about the sacrament of penance here, which, uh, as many of you know, uh, if you have studied uh, initiation at CTU, you will remember that penance developed from a one-time sacrament, which is a second baptism of tears, into the multiple sacrament, thanks to the Irish monks who uh, engaged us in uh, the multiple renewal of baptism through the sacrament of penance. Um, and so this is what I believe paragraph 47 is saying in here, that, that our lives, that what we do and how we live our lives is not immaterial. And we do defile ourselves uh, with personal sin and social sin, but this defilement does not stain us forever if we have at least continued to reach out towards God, that fundamental option towards truth and towards love. Then he says, and this I, I think this is a great passage, the pain of love becomes our salvation and our joy. It is clear that we cannot calculate the duration. All right, here he's playing off of the notion of 50 days in purgatory, three years in purgatory, with a whole indulgence uh, questions that came into play that you saw before the council. 30 days indulgence, 50 days indulgence, you know. So he's saying, he says, it is clear that we cannot calculate the duration of this transforming burning in terms of chronological measurements of this world. This transforming moment of this encounter eludes earthly time reckoning. And this is where we had collapsed our metaphors, taking them very literally to mean X number of years or days in purgatory. Um, it eludes earthly time reckoning. It is the heart's time, time of the heart. It is the time of passage to communion with God in the body of Christ. So uh, Benedict as a, as a classic uh, scholar is basically saying, you can't think about this. And long before he writes Space Salvi, even indulgences uh, were changed. They were no longer calculated by days or year. If you look at the new indulgences, uh, there were the indulgence of partial or plenary indulgence, and all those days and years were eliminated uh, at the Second Vatican Council. Finally, in paragraph 48, he says, the belief that love can reach into the afterlife, that reciprocal giving and receiving is possible, in which our affection for another continues beyond the limits of death. This has been a fundamental conviction of Christianity throughout the ages, and it remains a source of comfort today. So he's basically saying, well, can we still pray for the dead? Does our prayer and our affection impact them at all? Because that's what that Portziuncola moment, remember when I mentioned that at the beginning when I was a kid, we were connected to the dead, the living, the church militant and the church suffering were connected so we could help one another out. He's saying that love can indeed reach into the afterlife, after death. That's, our, that's certainly old fundamental Christian teaching. 
But the further question arises, if purgatory is simply purification through fire in the encounter with the Lord, judge and savior, how can a third person intervene even if he or she is particularly close to the other? So how can we assist the dead if purgatory in this new key is a purification in the fire of love with this encounter with Christ that he's developing? And so he says, when we ask such a question, we should recall that no man is an island. No person is an island, entire of itself. Our lives are involved with one another. Through innumerable interactions, they are linked together. No one lives alone. No one sins alone. No one saves, is saved alone. This is this corporate understanding that you find in Israel, that even the corporate understanding that the whole nation will rise, the dry bones of Ezekiel, that, 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 the, that, the, that we even believe as Catholics that the whole communion is saved by Christ, that it is personal but never private salvation. It's personal hyphen communal always. And so Benedict is, is, is playing into that notion here. And then he says, and I just think this is amazing to find in a papal encyclical, this word, in the interconnectedness of being. Um, this, is a great, this is a great notion. He's using contemporary philosophy uh, and a metaphysics that says, there is an interconnectedness of being. My gratitude to the other, that is the dead person, my prayer for him or he, her, can play a small part in his purification. And for that, there is no need to convert earthly time to God's time. In the communion of saints, simple terrestrial time is superseded. It is never too late to touch the heart of the other, nor is it ever in vain. So the prayer and the sending of love and the remembering of the dead, as the Jews do it in the Kaddish, the remembering of the dead, I, every morning I wake up and I have a list of the dead whose names I bring in. Um, there's that communion, that interconnectedness of being uh, that we partake in. Our hope is always essentially also a hope for others. Only thus is it truly hope for me too. So, um, uh, I'm going to leave it at had I, because we have only 15 minutes left. There is another paragraph in paragraph 40, where he talks about the old custom of offering it up. Remember, offering up our, our, our prayers, our works, our joys, our sufferings of the day. We offer them up. He, um, I'll just show this to you. This is in paragraph number 40. So it's before the purgatorial one, but it's germane to what we're talking about. He would say, and this is, this I think is a very interesting one. I would like to add here another brief comment with some relevance for everyday living. There used to be a form of devotion, perhaps less practiced today, but what quite widespread not long ago that included the idea of offering up the minor daily hardships that continually strike at us like irritating jabs, therefore giving them a meaning. Of course, there were some exaggerations and perhaps, and this is key here, unhealthy applications of this devotion, where we would oppress the poor with saying to them, oh, you're poor, offer it up. And yet we were totally, totally colluding with unjust structures and unjust systems. And, and, and he's, He's alluding to that here, where there were exaggerations and unhealthy applications of this devotion. But we need to ask ourselves whether there may be not after all has been something essential and helpful contained herein. What does it mean to offer something up? Those who did so were convinced that they could insert their little annoyances into Christ's great compassion. Uh, the, the passage in St. Paul making up for the sufferings of Christ so that they somehow become part of the treasury of compassion 
so greatly needed by the human race. In this way, even the small inconveniences of daily life could acquire meaning and contribute to the economy of good of the human love. Maybe we should consider whether this might be judicious to revive this practice again. So that's uh, about uh, 35 minutes. We started a little bit late of, of this. And um, to sum up, the purgatory in a new key is that at the moment of death, um, uh, those of us who live in that middle ground where, we're, where we are already living in hell by dying, our soul already dying because of a refusal to connect with God or so in communion with God that we are already in heaven. For those of us in the middle, uh, Benedict's is seeing is that at the moment of judgment, it is an encounter with Christ. It is a fire that burns us and makes us uh, um, an, uh, a new creation and prepares us for full communion with God in the communion of saints. So there you have it. Well, thank you so much, Richard. Um, at this point, I'd like to um, invite anyone who has questions to go ahead and, and put them into the chat and we'll or have comments or even yeah, comments. Or comments, ideas. Um, let me just say from my perspective, I think maybe ben Pope Benedict XVI wrote those, those words, um, imagining that, um, that Father Richard Fragmini would be reading them to us because I've never heard them in a more beautiful fashion. <laughs> Um, Thank you. Let me just say that for me, one of the things that's that's most touching is really that that paragraph forty seven, um, you know, and bef before his gaze, before Christ's gaze, all falsehoods melt melts away. Right. And when when we think about uh, the falsehoods we tell ourselves, that we tell others, that we believe in, that we fall prey to. Um, wow, what a beautiful, a beautiful yeah, right. and gift. It's, it's almost as if, it's almost as if he's wanting to retrieve this doctrine from simply a Dante, Dante-esque understanding that purgatory, you know, is, is almost as bad as hell for a while. Um, and he wants to situate it within the context of the human experience that we're already beginning separation from God. So he doesn't talk about universal salvation here, mm -hmm. but he gets really close. Mm -hmm. If you read this document, he gets really close to the thought that who could refuse mm -hmm. such a loving gaze at the moment of death? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. So, so we do have a question. Um, is there any sort of disparity between what Benedict XVI writes in Space Salvi and John Paul II wrote in Veritatis Splendor about the fundamental option for good? I, I, I don't think so. I think, they're, I think they're quite resonant with one another because, because basically what Benedict is saying is that even, you know, that, that to, 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 uh, it's a terrible thought to think that this fundamental desire that even what Augustine talks about this, uh, our hearts are made for thee, that that, that could actually be extinguished uh, while we are alive. That that's a terrible thought that, that somehow that there are members of our uh, sisterhood, our brotherhood, there are human beings that actually quench out this desire for God. Mm -hmm. uh, it's so that the, I, that there, there's a there's a resonance between what they're doing, even though Benedict the Sixteenth is not mentioning fundamental option per mm -hmm. se in this encyclical. That's what he's getting at. That we do see in uh, in in uh, John Paul II's writing. Mm -hmm. So again, I'll invite people to, to type in questions, but one of, since there's nothing there, I'll ask another one. Um, one of the things that I find so interesting is this connection between the maturing of the soul and, and that, that process of continuing to reach out. And 
I came across more recently a book that I read when I was quite young called People of the Lie by M. Scott Peck. Oh, yes. Maybe I, some I, of you have seen I, that. He actually uses that, the people yes, of the lie. Yes. And in fact, yeah. one, so his thing is, it's not about, you know, it's about denying that one lies. <laughs> right? So it's the hiding from the sin and, and the denial of that. And that that's what is eventually bringing that closure um, that doesn't allow the reaching out and the maturing and the growth to continue. Right. So basically the terrible thought is that somehow we destroy our own souls in hell, mm -hmm. even now. How many of you have ever heard the expression, I'm living my purgatory now, you know, that I'm being purgated now, you know, or, 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 or some people say, this is like living in heaven, you know? So there's always the use of human experience to talk about afterlife uh, possibilities. Mm -hmm. There was a question that came forward yeah. mm -hmm. that I noticed uh, from one of our students here, um, uh, one of our Vincentian students. Uh, it, it is a good explanation on why we continue to pray for the dead. Can you say something about the fact that they also can pray for us? Uh, this is a debated question. You know, can the, can the poor, we call them the poor souls, or the holy souls, can the souls in purgatory pray for us? This is a big debated question. And there's been no formal formal uh, decision on this uh, from uh, the ordinary magisterium of the church. There's no formal decision. It, it, it seems uh, as if the, the, we, we would say that the church suffering, the purgatorial, those who are in the, the encounter of Christ's gaze of love, that they would not be able to pray for us until that communion with God was complete. So uh, I know that there is devotion to the poor souls in purgatory, but there's never been a definitive uh, Catholic teaching on this um, either way. That's, that was, uh, that's, that yeah. I think is the question. Yeah, and the, the comment in Spanish was very similar, wondering if they're thinking, continuing to think of us. So it was along those same lines. Yeah, and then there's a wonderful uh, question uh, uh, from Leota. Padre Pio says, I believe that not a great number of souls go to hell. Uh, yeah, I mean, I remember as a kid even thinking, uh, how many, I, I mean, hell exists. But who's there? I, I used to say to myself as a little kid, because the, the catechesis was it very difficult to commit a mortal sin. I, I don't know if any of you were told this. It was difficult. You had to have right intention. You had to know it was wrong. You had to do it anyway. And I always felt, but if we believe that God loves us, who would ever want to do that? Uh, and even even in the, uh, the Catholic tradition, which is still there in the act of contrition, there is the notion of perfect contrition and imperfect contrition. Do you recall that? Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm sorry, Lord, because you are so good and deserving of all my love, perfect contrition. And the other, which God meets us and purifies us, is this notion of uh, because I dread the loss of heaven and the pains of hell, the imperfect uh, contrition on that side. So Padre Pio is, uh, is pointing in the same direction. Mm -hmm. Others? Great. I think we have time for this one last comment. This is a question, um, and maybe we can get more into this next week. Do you feel that this doctrine is overlooked at funerals? Often it seems that people are canonized at the altar I know it is a tough time to tell the bereaved about purgatory, but what do you think is the right approach to funeral homiletics? Yeah, I mean, this is, uh, thank you. I think that's Connor Quinn. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Connor, for that. Um, if there's something very important in that question, and we're gonna talk about that next week because the, and this is even what Legoff says, Legoff laments in that book, the birth of purgatory I showed you. He laments that the Catholic imagination is not 
richer. Now he writes this before Benedict's encyclical because Benedict, what he wants to do is enrich the doctrine of purgatory uh, to say that there is an ongoing um, conversion, metanoia, that takes place, especially with the, uh, the narrative of the immortality of the soul that we talked about last week. Huh? Waiting for the resurrection, of course, which is the other narrative, but the two have been joined together. Um, yeah, it's a tough one because many funeral homilies are canonizing the dead. Mm -hmm. The homilies. Well, yeah, or, or the, the funny things the person did wrong are joked about, right? Right, or the, or the eulogies. <laughs> I can see even the, the eulogies at the end of mass, that's what they're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Eulogies, the eulogain. It's, it's supposed to be good words. Well speaking, yeah. That, that's, that's, that's said, that's spoken well of, you know. But the homily, what do you do with the homily? And how do you engage? I personally give the, my, the students, the preaching students at our school, I give them this to read, to enrich their palette of colors that they can use when they're speaking about death and they're speaking about the afterlife, at least according to this contemporary read of the doctrine of purgatory. On the other hand, I have been to funerals at other churches in this Archdiocese of Chicago where the priest only talks about purgatory in the homily. And actually, in some of the cases, they take up collections at funeral masses so that masses could be said as uh, for the souls in purgatory because we got to be sure that this person is going to spend a few years there without having read this uh, piece by Benedict that you can't use temporal time to talk about eternal time. Wow. Very good. Well, Very good. thanks so much for all that you've offered to us here, Father Fragamini. Really, really appreciate it. Feel okay. like these sessions are just building upon each other. So may, thank I, may I say one last thing, please? Yes. <clears throat> please, folks, don't believe my interpretation of this. I've, I've edited some of these for the sake of this time. Take a look at this encyclical. It's especially the last paragraphs where he's talking about uh, judgment and life and the interbeingness of reality. I mean, when I read that, I'm saying, wow, that sounds like what we need to understand about ecology today, the interbelongingness that we have with this planet and the hell that we're putting ourselves in on this planet by forgetting that very understanding of, of, of interconnectedness, interbeingness of reality. So read it for yourselves. I hope to see you, some of you next week. We're talking about funerals and some of these questions will come up again. Thank you, Marian. Thanks, Richard. I know you have to go to teach another class. Um, for those of you who are here, just, I mean, I did put the link to Space Salvi in the chat earlier. Um, I also put a link to the grant and you know, we do these offerings for free, but if you'd like to make a donation to CTU, I did put that link toward the top of the chat as well. So really appreciate you being here and hope that this has been um, enriching for all of you. So thanks so much for being here. Bye, everybody. Good night.